great start. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. We're really happy that you could be with us today. I wanted to start out with uh, giving you a little update on Kim. As you know, she hasn't been well, but she had a very successful back surgery on Thursday. And we ask again that you please uh, remember her in our prayers, as I know she uh, heals and gets better and quickly back with us. I, we are fortunate, though, to have Lori Moffitt, who's going to be helping us welcome as a way as our backup moderator. So look for um, Lori's going to be collecting questions as we go through the show. And, of course, we have Tammy Moore, our faithful, faithful, closed captioning and moderator. And, excuse me just for a second. My apologies. Everyone knows I'm still suffering from pneumonia, and it's going away, but it's taking a while. Anyway, let's keep on going, and I would be really appreciative if you who are new in the uh, session today, do we have anyone new today? Is my chat, putting it in the chat, or yes, we do, a couple, great. Okay, I know most of you are not comfortable with this uh, new interface yet that we're going to be going through and using. So I want to take a couple of minutes, which we're going to be doing this for the next couple of shows, to uh, just help you walk through how to navigate the, the new Blackboard Collaborate. And if you haven't done so already, uh, maybe you want to wait a little later to uh, do your audio setup with it, but it's right up here at the top of your window, and the audio has the microphone with the red starburst. But let's take a look at what uh, Collaborate looks like right now. Lauren is not all together here. She should actually tell you what the, the topic of the day is. So. Forgive me. Here we go. I'll, should I start again? I don't know. But let's uh, carry on. We we are really fortunate today. She says she's nervous, but I know she's going to be great. We have Carolyn Stanwood, who is our featured teacher of the day, and she's going to be going through her experiences uh, and using Web 2.0 tools. So welcome, Carolyn. Now getting the right uh, pattern here. I'm going to go back to talking about the collaborate and the new look. You'll see right now, as all of you can see, that we have what we call panels now. There's three of them on the left-hand side, one for audio video. If you want to just diminish it, you can click on that area. It'll take up a little less uh, real estate on your screen. Then we have the participants window and the chat window, and of course, this area here where we play around with the map and the whiteboard. Let me separate each of these pieces so we can uh, have a better understanding of how they work. Again, the audio setup wizard is right here at the top right-hand corner. If you haven't done so in a few minutes, run it through and uh, you'll be sure that you're hearing properly or if you're going to come to the mic later that your mic is working. And please remember, if you don't have a USB headset, please just type your questions in the chat because we'll probably get feedback from your speakers if you don't have that. So keep that in consideration when you want to come to the, to the mic. And I just said a minute ago, let's diminish it to look like this. You're going to come to the, to the mic. Here's your access to click your mic on and off and it's the same thing on. And when you first talk, you please shut it off. And you can adjust your levels for audio and the microphone on that particular setting. The participants window gives us a lot more fun than we're used to. Right here, under your name, you'll have these uh, buttons that you can play with. Smiley faces, we have a whole list, uh, easy to access. Some of you have already figured out a way. That just means that you've stepped away from the computer. That doesn't mean you have signed out. Sign out, remember, you have to close out the whole. Uh, collaborate window either on the PC or shut it down on your Mac. As well, if you want to raise your hand, you know that symbol now. It comes up with a little number beside you. If there's a whole rush of people coming to the mic, you'll be obviously numbered in sequence, uh, one and so on. We're going to be voting here again on our poll questions, and it's this little spot here we have to click on there, and this is what you get is a drop-down menu, so you select yes or no, and hopefully you'll be able to figure this out so everyone can vote today. Let's look at the Next part of our window is the, the chat. I'm reminding you that it is a supervised chat. But what's happening now that you have, we used to talk about wide layout, we can actually move the chat panel or block or widget. See, I'm moving it in the middle. And what we often do and what we're playing with now is putting it over the right hand side. And let me show you how you can actually do all this. What you need to do is grab onto the top of your widget or your panel, and then I drag it over here to the right, and you can resize it by pulling out the, wall, the side of the widget or pulling it down so it's as big as you want so you can actually see it. So you can do that with all the functions uh, right now, but we want you to really pay attention to the chat because it flies by really quickly, and we found that's a little 
easier to uh, watch the chat. Unfortunately, it does cover a little bit of the uh, whiteboard, but you know you're going to have to play where you're comfortable in setting up the chat. We're a little bit different again layout for the chat. And remember, we used to uh, right click and you would see the the chat going up and down with different colors. What's happening now is you get a, a several windows appearing. So the main room is here, and if you had right clicked on Peggy's name, you would get another tab showing up here with a conversation that you would click back and forth, and similar here for Lori. If you want to uh, close out that uh, conversation, you click on the circle, blue circle with the X. Watch when you're typing back and forth. If you're talking just to Peggy, make sure Peggy's uh, little tab is standing outside in the front of the other two. Type in your comment, and it'll go directly to Peggy. But again, remember it says supervised, so we do see all the conversations going. Now, if you're having a conversation, Watch what happens here. If you were on another tab and you'd want to talk to Peggy, that, then you get a little uh, white bubble that pops up and lets you know that she's sending you a, a message. So, so one thing that we do need you to learn how to do, though, is using the whiteboard tools. And today we're only going to concentrate on one of them, and that is your uh, pointer. It's called the starburst. But we're going to use that particular whiteboard tool to show where you are on the map. So when we get that to that point, you need to click on the pointer drag it onto the map. I just want to let you know where it is because, as I said before, things have changed where everything is. Here's your whiteboard tools right alongside your panel. And a reminder that uh, the show is recorded. For someone who is new, please uh, go back. If you want to see the uh, repeat of the show or any of our past shows, you'll find the full uh, MP3 uh, recording uh, an MP4 video. There's also the full Illuminator, excuse me, Collaborate recording for you and a list of links. So all the information you're going to get today is uh, posted for you on our website. So if something goes flying by and you didn't see that, that link or that comment, we, you will be able to get access after the show. And one of the things I want to uh, do right now is take a second and sh make sure you know what the live binder is in how it works. So just going to see if I can't load this up for everyone. We're going to move from our slides in just a second. I'm just waiting that to load up. It may not load up for everyone at the same time. We have to make sure that you understand there's a couple of things that happen with uh, Word documents and PDFs that they don't um, seem to appear in this area where if you'd clicked on any of these great links, you would see it uh, um, render in the middle of your screen. They're probably downloaded for you. So, and it happens very quickly, and it happens in Firefox 4 and 6. So pay attention to what actual browser you're using, and if it's not working, maybe take, take a change of uh, the browser if it works a little bit better. But again, all the links that uh, Carolyn's going to be sh uh, sharing with us are in the live binders, and Peggy was just dropping in the link to the live binders. It's a ter ter terrific resource that you can use to uh, catch up on the things you missed or uh, look for the resources that uh, Carolyn's showing and sharing with us today. So let's get started with the fun, I think. We're going to do the world map. So this is when you need to go over to that pointer in the whiteboard tools and click on it. Make sure you have a little starburst and come over here on the map like I'm doing and clicking on the map shows where you are. And if you can't make that work, just type in the chat window where you're located. It'll take a minute while you all get a chance to play. Smiley face, that's a different looking starburst. It is your chance to, you know, be a little interactive with the tools that we have. I know Shambles is here from Thailand again. Thank you, Shambles. You're always with us. It's a great pleasure to have you. And Shambles always sharing some great ideas and resources he creates in the in the chat. So most of you are here from the United States and a lot of people on the West Coast. A few of us. Oh, Alberta. Welcome, Tony. Nice to have another Canadian here. I'm from St. Catharines, Ontario. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. Sorry, you'll have to tell us in the chat where you're from because I'm sorry, I don't remember. Sacramento, Los Angeles, great, thank you. We're always so excited to see the, 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 the depth and breadth of the people across the, the globe. And I know Virginia's here from Italy, so ciao Virginia, benvenuti. 
Okay, we've had our fun. Now you have to make some time. Let's get quickly going so Carolyn can talk. Let's look at um, where do you belong on this continuum of uh, technology. You can use your laser pointer again here. Click on beginner, somewhere in the middle, or advanced. And this again, you can't make that tool work. Let's just type it in the chat. So everybody take a second and try and put where you are on the continuum. And Carol said something while she was getting ready. She says, so many people are going to maybe know more than we are. And, and, and we tried to tell Carolyn that she has her own great perspective and things that she's gone through. And it's always new to hear and exciting to hear someone's perspective. And it's always a little bit different. Of course, and we also know that if we have really experts, we seem to have a lot of them, they're going to be sharing their ideas and share and collaborate as we go through the show in the chat room. So great. Now we're going to use the voting because then we have a three vote poll of questions. So at the top of your participants window, use the green check or the red X. Can you answer for us? Are you using Google Apps school wide in your school? So I'm just going to wait till people are voting. So it's at the top of the participants window, that right hand little button. You gotta click on it till you see the green check or the red X. And I'm just going to publish the results. Move my pointer. So, only a few are actually using Google Apps school wide in your school. So, Carolyn, you're going to have some good information to share on that one. So, now we need to clear the votes and, and go to the next poll question, which is Are you using Evernote for things like organizing, keeping track of resources, and collaborating with others? So, yes, if you're using Evernote, and no, if you're not. Just waiting for those votes to catch up to us. So it's at the top of the participants window, drop down on the right hand side, green check if you are and red X if you're not. Because we have a few people who haven't been able to get the votes. We're just about there. Okay, let's take a look at uh, the results here. There you go, Carolyn. Still, quite a few people are not using Evernote, so I know the ideas that you're going to be sharing, they're really great to enjoy hearing how you've managed to use them successfully in your work you do. Let's go to the next poll question. I'm going to clear the votes. And the last one is, do you have a personal learning network you use to support your professional learning? Queen check if you have and write X if you don't. It's Ray for a PLN. People in the chat are PLN. And if you don't know what a PLN is or how it's working, Carolyn's going to share that with us in a minute. A couple more votes. All right, let's show the results. And an overwhelming number are using PLNs, and a few people are not. So I know that people are going to be sharing how they do it in the chat, and Carolyn is going to be giving us her update. So let's move on from our fun with the poll questions to our actual show, because I know you can't get uh, waited, can't wait to get started with Carolyn Stanley, who is our featured teacher today. Her website is evolvingclassroombethany.blogspot.com. And I, I just want to give you a, a little bit of background about Carolyn. I know that she's going to be sharing more about herself as, we go, as she goes through her show. But the, the exciting thing I found with, with Carolyn is that she's a lifelong, lifelong learner. You know, through her, her, her beginnings in 1969, she was starting as an a English teacher in junior high in Orange, which is a part of Amity Regional District Number 5. And uh, she taught for nearly 10 years until she stepped aside and raised her family, which many of us have, many of has us have done that. Uh, she returned to teaching full time in 1998, but this time uh, as a computer technology integration specialist. So that that's where her experiences are that she's going to be sharing with us today. But in her passion for lifelong learning, you'll still find her um, presenting at the NEC conference and writing for 
uh, the ISTE publication, Learning and Leading with Technology. And the, the fact that she never left teaching while she was raising family is, is still laudable because she was busy uh, with adult education and, and tutoring for um, the homebound. So, uh, Carolyn, I know you've got some other great ideas and more information about the fact, that, yes, that you are uh, a Den star and that you love working with a professional learning network. I am going to turn the microphone over to you now at this point so that you can uh, start your presentation. And, and please feel free to share more about yourself as you go through this session. So welcome, uh, Carolyn, and everyone in the chat room. I know we're going to have a great presentation today. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Thank you so much, Lorna. Uh, and I also want to thank Peggy and uh, Kim. Uh, I'm so honored to be part of this wonderful professional development platform. I also want to thank Steve Hargadon. Uh, I've been watching his um, uh, Future of Education webinars as well. In fact, it was Steve's uh, personal attention to me in chats where he would actually respond to things I dropped in chats and his personal emails to me that uh, hooked me up with Classroom 20 and with Peggy and Peggy has just been my mentor and I, I really can't believe I'm here. There are so many other wonderful teachers who are so far more advanced than I am but Peggy has assured me that my story might actually um, be of interest to others, so I'm going to continue. I also want to thank my district for being solidly behind ramping up uh, our use of technology to improve student learning. If it hadn't been for our district support um, with uh, being flexible in different sites that are blocked, with uh, allowing us to actually use Google Apps for Education and the like, uh, I don't think any of us, myself and many of the other teachers who are integrating technology in our district would be able to do what we do with our students. Now, I did want to mention, uh, talking back about personal learning network, I picked this up from uh, Tom Whitby, who has My Island View, and he says that there are 7.2 million teachers uh, in the United States, and only a very few of them are on social media for professional reasons and how it's so important that we spread the idea to all of our teachers of how important it is now that technology has allowed us to connect with other teachers to ramp up our own personal learning networks. All right, I'm going to um, go to the next slide if I can figure out how to do this. Whoops, you know what? I, oh, I found it. All right, forgive me. Making technology integration an integral part of our school culture. All right, where do I begin? Well, I already began. <laughs> uh, I have lots to share. I'm aiming this at presentation at teachers who sometimes get overwhelmed with the rapid pace of many webinars, and I hope I don't do that. I ended up adding more and more content. I've really been working on this all summer long, so I, I hope I don't overwhelm people. Uh, thank goodness for the recording. Uh, the Classroom 2.0 is recording, the recordings of Future of Education, the recording of the wonderful Discovery Education webinars. Uh, that allows us to go back at our leisure to be able to pick and choose, fast forward through some of them to the points we want to listen to. Uh, I really appreciate the recordings. I appreciate the live binders and the blog that they put into Classroom 2.0. All right. There are many of many teachers that are just getting their feet wet in tech, tech educate integration, but they really desire to make a splash. I'm not sure that the audience here is indicative of those teachers, but maybe there will be a couple. All right, a little about me. Um, Lauren has already said how I taught English. I took uh, nearly 20 years off uh, to raise my two boys. I was always uh, doing homebound tutoring, uh, I did substitute teaching, and I also taught GED and ESL in the adult education program, and I was also the, um, the data input person and the liaison with the um, adult education uh, department at the state for our district, and that, of course, helped me to ramp up my computer skills. Uh, looking back when I was teaching English, I was an early tech integrator. Um, 
I remember how difficult it was to use technology back then. We had to order films, movies. We had to wait for them to come through the mail. We had to hook them up on a reel-to-reel -reel projector. Sometimes uh, the movie would, uh, the actual film would split. We'd have to splice it together while 28 kids waited for us to continue the movie. But um, so that's why things like discovery, education, streaming, and all the wonderful free streaming resources on the web make integration so much easier today. Um, also, the tape recorder. I didn't even know I was really doing anything, but when I taught English, I was recording songs and actually having kids listen to uh, not songs on the tape recorder and, and do uh, English activities, answering questions, analyzing songs, as well as just print poetry. Um, I ran the drama, drama club for many years, and we, for one of our things, we took the tape recorder and we tape recorded the play Sorry, Wrong Number. Um, the kids and I uh, integrated music into that tape, and then we broadcast it over the PA, and that was one of our play presentations besides the ones we did on the stage. So I guess I've, I've really been integrating technology before I before I knew I was. All right, I returned to teaching full-time in 1998 as a computer technology integration specialist. I um, started with uh, a Mac lab, and my Mac lab is in the uh, upper left-hand corner. We had ClarisWorks, and uh, we did all kinds of projects using ClarisWorks and using the web. Um, and then we switched over, I'm not even sure what year, but we switched over to a PC lab. And um, let's see, I've got to look at my notes here. Um, I had to redo all of my instructional documents to make them work with the PC. I also, uh, I not only did uh, seventh grade rounds where I taught kind of technology in isolation to the kids, but I had a ninth grade elective where we did build a business. And again, most of the time we were using Microsoft, well, when we switched to the PCs, Microsoft Word applications. Uh, there's a little um, bulletin board with some of the kids' projects. They did uh, newsletters. They created logos. They made um, maps to their business. They did uh, use spreadsheet to create budgets. Uh, they did uh, a hierarchy of the business, all kinds of neat projects that the kids really enjoyed. Now, I also taught um, internet safety. Actually, this is when we had, we had ninth graders at our school for a number of years, and then the ninth graders went up to the high school. And when they went to the high school, things started to change. And I uh, ended up doing a lot more of the integration of uh, technology, working with the classroom teachers, as opposed to just um, teaching technology in isolation. And I had, uh, so it became almost exclusively where I worked with teachers in the classroom, but I did have an encore class in the afternoon, and I saw every student in the school for a period of nine days. And with the seventh graders, I did uh, internet safety, and I did um, a little bit of introduction to Flash. We had Macromedia 2004 at the time. And then with the eighth graders, I had been integrating technology into the curriculum through their subject areas. We did a lot uh, with Word. Kids satisfied all the competencies that we had deemed that they needed to have the basic competencies by doing newsletters. They did, a, they did lab reports and they set them up with a certain formatting that satisfied all the, the competencies. Um, kids, of course, PowerPoint, we had some competencies, but kids took the PowerPoint very nicely. They, they, were, they didn't really need a lot of instruction. Um, we, I used uh, some Photoshop with the eighth graders. Uh, they did an Andy Warhol portrait of themselves. We used a lot of internet, but let me go on here. We, this is where I was doing all these things. We were mainly working with the tools that were available to us as applications on the computer. 
Uh, however, I had started about this time to start developing a personal learning network, and I started learning about all these other wonderful tools that were available. Uh, in fact, um, the media specialist at the time, um, we have our wonderful media specialist with us today, but the media specialist at the time was very much into Web 2.0, and she also helped, she and I working together, helped to move the school in a new direction. Uh, as I said, the district really tries to, tried to support technology. You have to have technology in the school to do anything with it. So we had two wired computer labs. Uh, we had uh, a media center with an additional computer lab uh, and a bank of Macs. This is recent for video editing. Uh, we have two wireless carts called COWS, Computers on Wheels. Uh, and we also um, have a dedicated music lab now for the music teachers, which I had forgotten to put into this presentation. But here again, the district was really pushing technology. We, on our professional development days, there were lots of professional development offerings in technology. And then uh, we did literacy walkthroughs. The uh, principals and assistant principals would be going and looking for our literacy initiative uh, being uh, carried out in the classrooms, well, then they started to talk about digital literacy. Uh, of course, uh, the teachers had projection devices, and um, they would oftentimes be able to project things from the web onto their screens. And of course, we started to move towards getting more um, smart boards. In fact, when we first went into um, the middle school concept, we, I'm losing my track here, we'd actually had our school renovated. We'd moved for a couple of years into modular classrooms, and then when we moved back into the renovated school, the two labs had smart boards. And gradually, over the years, we have brought more and more smart boards into the individual teachers' classrooms. All right. Um, now, as we ramped up, these are some of the things that we used at our school that really started to make technology a more natural part of our classrooms. Uh, Moodle was started system-wide. We had training, and every teacher was asked to develop a Moodle site, if nothing else than to put their assignments up or put a link to an existing site where they had their assignments. We were frightened quite a bit, as many people were, by that threat of the uh, bird flu um, epidemic. And so the superintendent wanted to make sure that there was something in place that if the schools had to be closed for an extended period of time, that there would be a online um, vehicle in place so that parents and students and teachers could communicate. And so that actually brought a lot of teachers who were not really tech savvy, but were kind of brought into learning how to use tech by developing Moodle accounts. Um, we also have a Discovery Education subscription at our school. And I have to say that I have learned a tremendous amount from uh, Discovery Education. I, went to a celebration of teaching and learning in New York City a couple years ago, and I met Whitney Mahulides. And then through her, she encouraged me to become a star discovery educator. I started attending um, some face-to-face -face discovery, um, I guess you'd call them conferences. There was one at the uh, Science Center in um, Hartford, Connecticut, which was actually where there were just a group of people together in a room watching the uh, stream-a-thon. And we also were able to go out and have free admission into the museum. And then I went to another one, uh, which was a face-to-face -face conference, which had lots of rooms where there were different um, people presenting. And I went to one of Whitney's uh, presentations and learned that, oh my goodness, not only did teachers have a the ability to log into Discovery and then stream uh, the videos for their students, you know, on a on a regular, uh, not just a smart board but a a view screen. But all of the students could have a login of their own, 
and that there were other deeper parts of discovery education where teachers could go in, create classes of their students once the students had been uploaded to the discovery education database. And they could easily go in and once the kids were uploaded, there would be a drop down list, they could make classes, and then the teachers could design lessons or or put uh, or send out to individual students, small groups, a whole group, the different videos and a lot of the different instructional uh, tools that are in Discovery Education. So when I learned that, I came back and I ran a little uh, Discovery uh, professional development session and the teachers that were there were, oh my gosh, the kids can have access to Discovery at home? We have to do this. So I got in touch with the administrator at the high school and uh, he, it took a little bit of doing, but he downloaded their um, spreadsheet and he was able to import all of the student information into that spreadsheet and upload it and voila, all of a sudden our students had access to this wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. In fact, our science teachers, uh, the state of Connecticut bought uh, Discovery Middle School Science for the entire state and it, it's uh, good until June of 2012. And our science teachers have really been using uh, Discovery Education to supplement their science lessons because it is all aligned with the Connecticut State standards. So that is one thing. If your school has Discovery um, and you don't have your kids uploaded, try to find a way to get them uploaded so that uh, you can, they can have access to all of the wonderful resources at home and in addition they can, the teachers can individualize for them. Um, Web 2.0, of course there are just tons of tools and they come at us fast and furious. I'm going to talk about a few later, but I've already mentioned the fact that smart boards helped us to ramp up. I understand this. I don't know too much about it, but the special ed teachers are using iPods. Uh, such that kids who previously would have had to have a story read to them by an aide, which is kind of embarrassing for them, could actually use the iPods to hear the story and keep up with the rest of the kids. Uh, this is our one of the science teachers I worked with for many years, and he brought his kids into my lab, uh, realized the power of the kids being able to be hooked to the web and he got a grant, so his whole science class. Hello? Hello? Uh, am I still there? there? I have an I echo. Have an echo. Okay, what okay, went wrong? wrong? It should be okay, Carolyn, go ahead. I think we have some of the microphone on. Okay. All right. I don't know what happened. I had a terrible echo there for a minute. Am I back? Okay. All right. Anyway, <clears throat> um, he started this end computing lab, and he has all of his resources up on Moodle, and he has the kids using Moodle and Google. Um, and they pretty much, he says he could actually step away and um, not really have to worry about, uh, he just moderates, he just facilitates. He lets the kids do the learning. Okay, I got a little rattled there. Now Google Apps for Education. This is something that because I had learned about this in various webinars, um, I was actually the one who introduced Google Apps to Education to our district. And what I did was I spoke to our district technology curriculum specialist and he did a lot of the legwork for me. He took it to the Board of Education and um, quickly uh, he, uh, he cleared it with the Board of Education, got permission, uh, and we brought in uh, Google to just my middle school to begin with. It was a little bit slow starting. The teachers had so many other things on their mind that they really couldn't concentrate on still another application. But some of the teachers who brought their students in, that science teacher being one in particular, 
um, introduced all of the kids to these wonderful tools, these collaborative tools of working together on a project using uh, Google Docs, of being able to do a, um, a presentation and work on it at home instead of having to depend on uh, working on a PowerPoint just in school. They could actually start a PowerPoint in school, they could upload it to um, their Google Apps account, share it out with other students and actually do the PowerPoint at home get the content in the slides and then if they wanted to they before they presented it they could download it at school as a PowerPoint and put in some uh, bells and whistles. So the kids also would start essays in school and they wouldn't be able to finish it. Now we do have a NAP system which is a network access portal system but a lot of times it didn't work well so the kids got used to just uploading their um, Word documents to Google, converting them to a Google Doc format, and finishing them at home. So the kids loved it, and as the kids loved it and used it and said, oh, to the teachers, oh, I've got this, can I share it with you? That It was kind of like bottom up instead of top down. The kids actually spread the use of Google. And the teachers began to see how it was a really easy way to share out resources. Um, and so it has grown at our middle school. The middle school in Orange adopted it and now we will be moving this fall to district-wide adoption where all of the students and the teachers will be in uh, one domain. Alrighty, uh, let me go to this next slide here. Okay, I just wanted to talk one, a couple of incredible projects when we were just getting started with Google. One of our social studies teachers um, had the kids create travel logs as they were studying the African countries. And what was unique about this is that the, um, the kids were not in groups in the same classroom. He would have the groups from different periods. So they were forced to collaborate using Google Docs. He um, put into their portal different, well actually at this time we didn't have the, kid, the kids log into Discovery, but he would have them, when they came into the lab, they would watch the Discovery Education videos on Africa and they would take notes on those videos in their Google Docs. And then they, would, they did a script in Google Docs uh, and gathered their pictures that they were going to use. Um, to eventually use Photo Story 3, which is a program on the local computer, to create a, um, a video, a travel log of their country. And there were certain things that the teacher insisted that they have in there, you know, the languages, the type of government, the population, cultural uh, events, etc. And then they were mounted on his blog, and then the kids were asked to go in and to watch the other students' videos and then comment in a very um, positive manner on the different videos. I just um, was looking this morning on our domain, our Google Apps for Education domain, and I found that our current social studies teacher, a lot of the teachers now are integrating technology on their own. Some of it I'm involved in, some I find out just by getting out there and communicating with them. But she allowed the kids in their study of Africa to do uh, a blog or to do a Glogster, which is a poster, or to do a Photo Story 3, uh, or to do a Prezi. So she gave them choice of a lot of these different web tools. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. But I'm just saying that, that Google was amazing. Um, Google Apps was amazing. In fact, um, we also did the Mandarin Chinese teacher who teaches in Orange and in Bethany was able to um, get the kids collaborating between the two schools. The uh, seventh graders worked on Google Sites and they were able to um, create sites with different pages in the site. Each group created its own site on customs of the Chinese New Year. And so that was the first time we've really gotten outside our school walls. 
that's something I really want to work on. And then she used voice thread with the eighth graders, and what she did was she put a series of slides about Chinese New Year, and then the students um, came in and they all commented on the different slides, and there were uh, students from both Orange and Bethany not only commenting on the slides, but they were assigned to uh, comment to each other. So we've had success with Moodle. Uh, one of our teachers likes Schoology better than Moodle. I've also been hearing about these other platforms, but there's just so many you can do at one time. It's a gradual process. Um, we've had, as I've already told you, Google Docs. We've used uh, the same teacher that is using Schoology with her kids uh, introduced the school to Prezi. And that really took off as a uh, form. It's like a PowerPoint on steroids. Uh, the, all of the links to these are with links to different examples are in the blog and in the live binder. Glogster is another um, application, which is an online uh, posting poster making application. And uh, the kids have really been enjoying that. Uh, our media specialist uh, was asked by our science teacher to uh, find a cartoon uh, program, and she found Go Animate. And we have a, a thing with our science teacher um, that she has uh, a select group of her kids work with first graders from another school that's up in New Britain, and so the. We, they used to work on PowerPoints together, but this year the kids worked together and they made little Go Animate videos. And uh, they had a great deal of fun with it. And the link to our Media Specialist blog is in um, the Live Binder. And then there's a link there to the different Go Animates that the kids produced. Uh, VoiceThread is a tremendous tool. We haven't used it as much as I would like to, but I introduced it to um, our language, one of our language teachers this year, and she always has to do an oral language um, testing with the students. And usually it meant that she set up a chair out in the hallway, and she would have to have the kids working on something in the classroom, and then she would have to do this oral test with the kids one by one. Um, and so she decided she would give VoiceThread a try. It's not the, it wasn't really interactive. It was her giving the kids the um, the thing that they were supposed to say orally. But the kids came into my computer lab, and they were all at their own individual stations, such that everybody could take the test within the one 40-minute period. And then she, at her leisure, could go and log into the VoiceThread. And then she could listen and uh, evaluate how well they did. So it was a great time saver, and it allowed her to not lose valuable teaching time. Uh, another thing we we did with VoiceThread was, as I said, the eighth grade uh, project with the uh, Ma uh, Mandarin Chinese. And I did have a group of students come in and participate in the VoiceThread. Uh, which was EarthCast 2009 that Matt Montaigne set up, and our kids actually came in and talked about how they were helping to recycle and to make the world a greener place. SketchUp. Now, I had learned about SketchUp, and I had made sure that SketchUp was on all of the was downloaded to all of the computers in both labs, and I knew eventually there would be a use for it, and we. Got a couple of years ago, a new tech ed teacher came in, and he is just the most amazing man in the world. And he had the kids using SketchUp extensively, uh, the seventh graders, to uh, build greenhouses and, when time permitted, to actually make physical models of the quote green um, technology houses. Uh, and he had the eighth graders actually uh, work collaboratively in teams to use SketchUp to create a whole uh, environment that would exist on the moon. And we actually took these projects to the um, CECA, which is the Connecticut Educators Computer Association um, 
legislative expo this past spring. And Skype, again, we've used it not as much as I'd like to see us use it, but our Mandarin teacher has had her kids Skype with our sister school in China. All right, I'm moving down the road. We are experimenting with students being able to bring in their own laptops and smart devices. This was recently approved by the Board of Education. And as I said, like with Miss, uh, with the Social Studies uh, Teachers Project, instead of telling kids that they have to use uh, Photo Story 3 or they have to use Windows Movie Maker or they have to use a certain Web 2.0 tool, we are really allowing them choice in which tool they'll use to present their assigned project. The teachers, of course, grade them on the content and they have rubrics for the content, but the kids get to do that uh, critical thinking process of which tool could they use to help them best present the information uh, in their project. All right, we have um, iPad initiative. Uh, Megan Wilson, who is iPod Civility, she's the special ed teacher at our sister middle school in Orange, and she is just terrific, and there are links to her site. Uh, I would say that the district has bought all of the teachers uh, iPad 2s, and I think that's going to be a real um, turning point because a lot of teachers who were not heavy technology teachers, uh, technology users, excuse me, will become more so once they have uh, found how great it is to do self-directed learning using the iPad. Uh, I also find that the iPad was a terrific device to capture great learning moments. Uh, with the video camera, which is terrific. You, you're a teacher, things are going on in your classrooms, you can turn the video camera on, you can capture, capture snippets of great learning moments, you can put them together using the 499 iMovie app that is downloadable to the iPad, and then if you create a YouTube learning channel, you can uh, upload right to YouTube and then share it out however. All right, I've already told how we've moved from the Google domains at the middle schools to district-wide adoption, how we're expanding the use of Skype. I, I would like to expand the use of Skype, and I'd like more voice thread experimentation. Oh, and then, see, I've worked very closely with our art teachers. We've done a lot of integration of technology in the art program in that they would do the traditional projects, and then they would come into the lab and we would have uh, digital photos of the um, abstract art that they had done or what have you. And then they would uh, use Photoshop to make variations on the themes of their abstract art. We did scratch art in Photoshop itself. I, at this particular stage of the game, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm, I can't even remember everything that we've done. Let me, let me continue on, but I just say that uh, I had GIMP downloaded to all of the uh, computers. Uh, the te our technician did that for us because I found by working with students, they helped me to learn that Photoshop can be opened by GIMP and so they can work at their uh, work on their projects at home, even if they don't have Photoshop. Uh, where I'd like to go to here from here, I am not really as far outside the walls of the school as I'd like to be, and I'm hoping my teachers will work with me so that we can try to connect with other students in other classrooms. Perhaps some people in the chat will um, get in touch with me, and maybe we can make something work there. I'd like to get the teachers I work with to develop PLNs of their own, and I'd also like to help teachers develop instructional screencasts of their own, uh, because that's one of the things that has started to change my teaching. I, um, I did a screencast for a pop art project where the kids had isolated their picture from the background, and then they opened it up in Photoshop, and they um, put it into four, they put their picture into four different layers and made like an Andy Warhol. I'm sorry I didn't put a picture in to show you, but the screencast I made is available um, in the live binder. And at first I used to do it with the whole class. 
listening. And I would stop them, and I have to go answer questions, and the kids would be sitting there, where do we go from here, twiddling their thumbs. Well, I uploaded that screencast to um, Google, and I was able to, um, using the group distribution, have it such that every single kid could access the screencast of the step-by-step -step directions of how to make their pop art portrait. And I just tried it for the first time this spring. The kids were sitting at the computer stations, headphones on. They could stop and start the video, and we got the best uh, pop art portraits this spring that we've ever had before. And the kids loved being able to work at their own pace, to be able to stop and start start and stop the video and then of course it freed up the art teacher and myself to move around and help kids with individual programs that I didn't do uh, because I didn't spend all that time at the smart board doing uh, teaching to the whole group. All right, developing a personal learning network. I want to thank Bob Sprankle. I think I got started with him. They do a uh, Thursday night seedlings webcast and he is just an amazing educator. In fact, you, there's a link to his voice thread uh, in the live binder where he has uh, just developed this voice thread for his parents to introduce them to the school website. And I encourage you to take a look at it because you might want to model, use his, uh, his, web, his voice thread as a model for your own schools. But I actually stopped on the way home. Uh, we go, I live in, I, I grew up in Maine, and we'd gone up to visit relatives, and I stopped at Wells Elementary School on the way back and met him in person, and he's the one who actually got me going with the Personal Learning Network. Um, EdTech Talk is what sponsors Seedlings on Thursdays nights. I, I started listening to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Uh, there was a terrific one with Renee Hobbs uh, back in January of 2010, and they were talking about Creative Commons. and and they were talking about uh, copyright and fair use, and it was it really was was great. EdTech Brainstorm. I met Matt Montaigne there. Um, K12 Online Conference Echo. This is all to do with K12 education, and this is brand new to me. So you just go to EdTech Talk, and you can find the different programs and all of the archives. Uh, Steve Hargadon, as I've already mentioned, is terrific. He does Future of Education, and he interviews uh, leaders in education. Um, and it, it's a, a wonderful program, and Steve is just an amazing man. Uh, Classroom 2.0, which is what we're on right now, I can't say enough about how much I've learned by listening to, by participating in the live webinars or actually going back and uh, viewing some of the archive webinars. I've already talked about discovery education and, of course, the DEN, which is the Discovery Education Network where all of the, um, all of the teachers get together in a personal learning network of their own, uh, learn wonderful things all the time from them. Um, and they have a DEN YouTube channel, which as far as I know is available you know, free to the public with all kinds of wonderful um, tutorials. Uh, Simple K Learning and CICL are both subscription services. Uh, Simple K Learning, however, does offer um, a lot of their webinars uh, for free to the public. Of course, they're hoping you'll join the learning community, but they are they're just terrific. And I did pay the money to um, get a subscription, and the they have training inside the um, subscription portal in Word, in I, the iLife uh, applications, in managing your classroom, in internet safety, and it's step-by-step -step tutorials um, where they're actually interactive. My biggest problem is finding the time to do as to do the training that I'd like to do in there because it's just more training than I could ever do. It's a real good value for the dollar. Um, Twitter. I have I only follow about maybe 50 people on Twitter. I follow all the top educators like Peggy George, and I have to say that I every single time that I go on Twitter, I pick up tremendous tremendous um, learning 
uh, links that help me with my um, hopefully some of them I can bring back to my school. I'm just getting started with Google Plus. I never joined Facebook, but I'm on Google Plus, and again, I'm following a few select people, um, educators, top educators in technology, and I'm just I'm just starting to learn how to use it, but uh, I understand that this might open up, Google Plus might open up using social networking uh, at schools that block Facebook. Let me see. All right. Uh, now, okay, applications that have helped me organize my learning. Blogging, I keep that blog. I don't blog every day uh, at Evolving Classroom Bethany, but I do try to uh, blog often, and it's, it's a really nice diary. If nobody else reads it but me, it's a nice way for me to go back and to uh, remember things that I've found important, and I hope more people will share it. Evernote. Evernote is something I just got started with this past spring. Uh, I have Evernote open in my system tray. Uh, it's a way that you can create new notes and you can copy into Evernote uh, links from uh, web pages. You can put entire web pages into a note. You can put pictures in. You can do audio notes to yourself. And you download it on a computer. I have it downloaded on my computer at school. I have it downloaded on my laptop here at home. And then I also have it, uh, the app on both my iPad 2 and my iPhone. And whatever I put into Evernote, wherever I create a note in Evernote, in any one of those applications, it automatically uh, syncs with all of my other devices. And I just got started with Dropbox, where uh, I a lot of the files that I needed to get to Peggy, I established a Dropbox account. I think I have two and a half gigabytes available. Uh, and I made folders in that Dropbox, and I put a lot of the uh, movies and documents that I needed Peggy to have access to into the Dropbox. Speaking of that, um, if Peggy, this whole presentation was done in Google Presentations, and Peggy and I uh, did, and uh, Lorna uh, did a lot of our communication through a shared Google Doc. So again, I, it, it's just, a, they're wonderful tools. Um, experiment with flipping my classroom, I've already addressed that. I not only did it with the pop art tutorial, but the kids come in and use Microsoft Word to create newsletters. And I um, I did the same thing. I uploaded my how to do how to tutorials for the newsletter, and 